Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never practice nunchucks in a crowded room. Never eat chole before a road trip. Always take your shirt off before you iron it. Don't take a call near a swimming pool. And don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Days after the Haryana poll setback, top Congress leadership, including Malikarjun Kharge and Rahul Gandhi, held a meeting with leaders from Maharashtra. Sunil Kanugalu, the party's in-house poll strategist, who had got flack for the Haryana fiasco, suggested that the party's poll promises should include a substantial increase in the freebies and doles that are currently given or promised to almost every section of the people in Maharashtra by the Mahayati, Mahayati government. A leader who was present in the meeting later told me how his party was losing the plot, as he said, losing the plot. And I'm quoting him here, you want to double the freebies this time? Then what? Triple in the next election? And then what next? And that was a Congress leader telling me. He argued that since every party was doing it now, the freebies could no longer be a game-changing strategy, especially for opposition parties. He was of the view that when it came to competitive populism, ruling parties had the advantage. I could not agree more. I mean, the Congress promised 600 rupees a month under its Nyay scheme in the 2019 poll manifesto. 12 times more than what the people got under the PM Kisan Samman Nidhi, that is uh, 6,000 rupees a year, it did not work for the Congress. There were, of course, other factors at play in the 2019 polls. By mid-2022, Prime Minister Nain Modi was talking about the dangers of Revdi culture. The success of the Congress party's doles in Himachal Pradesh and Karnataka assembly elections might have played a role in this change. By November 2023, the BJP far outmatched the Congress in rivalry distribution and promises in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, even as the PM sort of looked the other way. He, however, resisted temptations to declare rivalries ahead of the 2024 Lok Sabha elections. Many BJP leaders would privately attribute this factor to the BJP's slide to 240 seats in the Lok Sabha election. Now the PM has stopped speaking about rivalries as the BJP has gone full throttle to steal the opposition's march with a slew of rivalries in assembly elections. Just check out the 100, 146 decisions taken by the Maharashtra cabinet in the month ahead of the model code of conduct. They included many infrastructure projects also, but listen to Mahayuti leaders. The focus of their speeches is on the rivalries being offered. These rivalries have come to define the BJP's model of Vikas or development. PM Modi keeps inaugurating developmental projects, but his party leaders apparently find the rivalries more appealing electorally. Let's look at another big issue that the BJP used to attack the opposition from 2013-14 onwards, dynastic politics. It did not matter that the ruling party kept inducting dynasts from other parties. As long as a Chaiwala PM was the face, these dynasts were seen as aberrations or mere means to achieve the higher goal set by the PM. The BJP is taking it to a new level. So in the recently constituted Council of Ministers in Haryana, two prominent dynasts found a place. Shruti Chaudhary, former CM Bansilal's granddaughter and BJP MP Kiran Chaudhary's daughter. Another one was Arthi Singh Rao, granddaughter of former CM Rao Birendra Singh and daughter of Union Minister Rao Indrajit Singh. In Jharkhand, the BJP has fielded Purnima Das, the daughter-in-law of former CM and incumbent Odisha governor, Raghavar Das. Come to think of it, Das had presided over the BJP's defeat in the 2019 assembly election and lost his own seat. He recently made headlines after his son, Lalit Kumar, thrashed a Raj Bhavan official. With the BJP government in Odisha, the case had to get a burial anyway. 
Check out the list of lists of BJP candidates in Maharashtra and Jharkhand. They give a fair idea of the BJP's growing love for and reliance on dynasts, both homegrown and imported. The third big issue for the BJP was its crusade against corruption. The washing machine tag has, however, washed it away. Then there was the aspirational politics over India's place in the world, with Prime Minister Modi sitting at the high table of global diplomacy and who's who of the world vying for his attention. One did not hear much about it from the BJP in the last Lok Sabha elections. And it obviously does not find much merit in talking about it in the coming assembly elections either. The BJP's complete focus is on social engineering, offering olive branches to different caste groups, and building Batenge to Katenge narratives. Basically, politics has come full circle since 2014. It's back to the politics of the old days when it was all about caste, religion, freebies and so on and so forth. Not that these factors were not at play earlier, but they used to be all subsumed in the larger image of Nain Modi, the deliverer. He represented the big idea, the big dreams of an aspirational nation. Even when people saw the bringing down of governments through defections, opposition-centric corruption investigations and communal agendas, Modi remained an idea that they voted for. He was beyond follies or reproach. He remained the BJP's central proposition, the differentiator. Intermittent electoral setbacks in states aside, Modi, the idea remained vibrant. However, after the last Lok Sabha elections, the BJP looks underconfident about the potency of this idea, or so it seems from the way it's undermining everything that the idea stood for, from raveries to dynasts and all-inclusive politics and governance. Critics might quibble about the difference between projections and realities, but it did not matter when Modi personified the BJP. Going back to old politics may look pragmatic, in real politics today, Haryana results may be cited as the latest vindication. For all we know, the BJP may even end up winning Maharashtra and or Jharkhand. But going back to pre-2014 politics poses the risk of losing the differentiator. It will hurt the BJP in the long run and brand Modi in the immediate context. One may argue that the BJP has to prepare for the post-Modi era and come to terms with what may look like his diminishing appeal in assembly elections. But isn't the party coming to this conclusion way too soon? From pre-Vipers abolition to bank nationalization, Garibi Hatao slogan, and Bangladesh liberation to the emergency, and her elephant ride to Belchi, Indira Gandhi used to represent an idea. Howsoever contradictory in the eyes of her admirers and critics. Once she was gone, the politics changed. And it was not because of the BJP then. Once the differentiator is dead, multiple factors and forces come into play. Who expected Rajiv Gandhi, a man who brought computers and telecom revolution to lose his way in Muslim Hindu appeasement politics during his very first term after getting a historic mandate? Therefore, the way to prepare for the post-Modi era is not to undermine brand Modi, but to build on it and come up with another big idea. But for this, the BJP needs political imagination. The party may still have an edge right now, even with, with its politics coming full circle. It's helped by the lack of imagination in the opposition camp. That's also because they have not been able to counter the idea of Modi. If the BJP itself loses faith in the idea and takes politics to the pre-2014 era, it will be right up the opposition's alley. As it is, brand Modi or the idea of Modi remains vibrant even today. It still has a lot to give to the BJP, but the party has to have faith in its abiding powers. That's all from me in this episode of Politically Correct. Thanks for watching. Thank you.